For the past year, we've all experienced an intense sort of political or news vertigo. And I believe it's making us dumber by the day. Of course, part of this is due to the fact that Donald Trump is president. And he constantly scoops the story of the latest outrage about himself by performing yet another outrage, just as we start discussing the previous one. It's exhausting and brain melting. But this is also because major media organizations have all chosen to constantly chase the rabbit. In a way, all of us in media are complicit. When we're constantly on the run, it's very difficult to take stock of where we are and where we've been. To take a good look at the big picture becomes a luxury that none of us seem able to afford. And this is going to have serious consequences. Our brains are actually being altered. The way we process news and information, our ideas about what constitutes resistance and what constitutes tyranny. In general, we live in a society that doesn't study its own history. I mean, it's unvarnished history. And often current events are analyzed in a vacuum that almost never includes the context or history necessary to understand what's new, what's old, and how we got to where we are. We've become detached from our own reality and our own work. Having said all of this, I thought it would be fascinating to talk to David Harvey about the Trump moment. He is one of the leading Marxist thinkers in the world and an authority on Marx's Das Kapital, which turned 150 years old late last year. Harvey is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the City University of New York, and he was one of the pioneers of the discipline of modern geography. David Harvey has a new book out. It's called Marx, Capital, and the Madness of Economic Reason. David Harvey, welcome to Intercepted. Thank you. First, I'm curious, having now read uh, your book, how did we get Trump? If I had to simplify it, it it would be one word, alienation. That uh, you have a population that's increasingly alienated. Uh, It's alienated from its work process because there are not very meaningful jobs around. It's been promised a kind of a cornucopia of consumerism and they find a lot of products that don't really work. They find themselves having to renew their phone every two years. You find them uh, having to live a lifestyle, which is, uh, you know, they're disillusioned. And, And of course, they're disillusioned with the political process. They realize that it's big money that buys it. Uh, They're disillusioned in lots of ways. And it's not only in this country. Alienated populations don't necessarily behave in kind of a way that would probably make sense to somebody like me. They don't go to the left, for example. They just kind of say, give me something that looks different. And I think when Trump came along and said, I'm going to be your voice, He actually, you know, completely trumped, if I can use that term, Hillary Clinton. And I think the same thing you will see over the Brexit vote in Britain, where the metropolitan areas, which are doing okay, but you'll find alienated populations in those small towns where the basis of economic basis of life has just disappeared. So you get this kind of real rash of... uh, neo-fascist, populist, right-wing kind of uh, people who are coming along and saying, listen to me, listen to me, I have a different answer to all of these kinds of questions. And I think that that sort of thing is going on, not only in this country, but elsewhere. Do you believe that Trump has any ideology based on the actions that he's taken officially as president or the the ideas that he floats when he speaks or tweets? I think he has some ideas, whether it adds up to an ideology or not. I mean, for instance, one of his ideas is to dismantle everything that uh, Obama did. I mean, that's almost instinctual on his part. So he has ideas. An ideology, I I don't think he has a a clear uh, ideology. But he certainly has a persona who is, uh, you know, kind of it's about me, 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 and the narcissism is obvious. But I think this is a classic uh, sort of situation of uh, populist leaders. I mean, Trump's uh, a brand of what, you know, a lot of observers call his populism. But Trump has multiple mantras that he sort of repeats. And his favorite when he talks about his successes is stock market keeps breaking records. People's 401ks are just going through the roof. He never mentions that the vast majority of workers in this country actually have no pension and are not participating in 401k plans. The stock market is hitting an all-time high record for another, and think of this, 86 times since Election Day. And then you look at all of the money you folks are making. Oh, I wish I could take 10 or 15 percent, but I think you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. 
but it's getting better and better. Your pensions are getting bigger and bigger. What is going on right now on Wall Street and with the stock market? I mean, clearly, it is breaking records. Trump is totally right. The Dow is above 25,000. I mean, it's it's nuts if you if you think about it. What's happening on, on Wall Street? I think it's just a matter of that uh, since uh, the problems of 2007, 2008, what we've seen is essentially central banks uh, adding to the money supply. And the money has to go somewhere. And it mainly goes into the stock market. And of course, it mainly goes into the pockets of the top 1%. So actually, if you look at the indices of inequality since 2007, 2008, they've increased markedly, not only in the United States, but worldwide. And so in a sense, what you've done is you've, you've, you, you ran into a difficulty in 2007, 2008, and you answered it by throwing money at it, which has been great for the stock market and all the rest of it. But as we know, the incomes of ordinary people have not improved at all. Uh, people's situation hasn't, and hardly any of the benefits of the small recovery there has been since 2007 and 2008 have gone to anybody other than the top 1%. That's the bondholder's solution to the economic problem. Uh, and uh, the last tax cut uh, was really a bondholder's charter. So this has been the case in the United States that, in fact, the bondholders are, are creating an economy which is good for the bondholders. If someone were to arrive here from like a different universe and you were asked the question, what is the uh, the wages that workers are paid or the, the money that exists in the stock market or the money that uh, changes hands from we the people to companies like Amazon, what's it based on? Well, the dollar should be worth whatever it will buy, which is, uh, you know, the commodities and so on that people want. And we want useful commodities. And the trouble with that is that capitalism is very good at making commodities that don't work uh, or break down or only last for two years. I, I mean, I often use this example. I say, I'm using my grandmother's knives and forks. But if capital made things that lasted 100 years, uh, what would it do? Instead, it makes computers that uh, actually don't function if they're more than about three or four years old. One would like to think that capital was a, a rational system, but it's not. It's, it's irrational. It introduces these irrationalities because that's the only way it can reproduce itself. And I think, again, people are beginning to see that this is not exactly the good life that they thought they might have at some point down the line, particularly for the mass of the population now who are indebted or and who have to pay off uh, that debt, would be it credit card debt or mortgage debt or consumer debt. Or This is the world we're living in. We're living in a world of debt peonage in which most of the population is actually, uh, their future is foreclosed by the way in which the capital is wrapped around them. This kind of thing about the good life is borrow money and then everything will be okay. What about the role of Amazon, Google, Facebook in our lives? I mean, is is this something new in the evolution or devolution of capitalism? I don't think it's new. I just look at this historically. We went through from the 1970s onwards with what we call deindustrialization, the loss of industrial jobs and the loss of manufacturing jobs. And the result was that the unions, which were very strong, everything gets lost. So deindustrialization of the manufacturing sector was one big thing. Now we're seeing the same thing happening in retail and marketing. We're seeing it through Walmart, we're seeing it through Amazon, we're seeing it through online purchasing, and we're going to see happening in the retail sector the same thing that happened uh, in the manufacturing sector. And so then the question is, what kind of jobs are there going to be anywhere? And those places that do have the jobs are going to do what Amazon does, which is to say, well, you're not really doing anything significant. Uh, you're just doing manual way, but, you know, just packaging things and sending it out. This is a rather meaningless kind of work. This is what I mean about alienating kind of work. I mean, so here we have uh, a, a real transformation in, in labor processes, which I think is going to have a real big impact upon the American economy. The example of deindustrialization and what happened to industrial communities is now going to hit big consumer centers, which rely upon the retail business. What is your critique or problem with the idea that competition is going to give not only consumers but nation states the highest quality product? First, I would like to say what competition. We've got a tremendous amount of monopoly. <laughs> 
I mean, look at it in energy, look at it in pharmaceuticals, look at it everywhere, and actually there's a lot of monopoly around. So the competition is kind of fake competition in lots of ways. And internationally, of course, there is some sort of level of uh, competition going on between different nation states in terms of, but notice what it does. Basically, what you're supposed to do is to create a good business environment. That's what the state is supposed to do. And the better the business environment, the more capital will go to it. So that means lower taxes. Again, the last tax bill was very much about trying to improve the United States as a business environment. So you've got to give, actually, money to corporations. And that's this astonishing thing. The corporate capital doesn't seem to be able to survive these days without subsidies from the public sector. So in effect, the public is perpetually supporting large corporations. And they're not really competing. They're simply using their monopoly power to assemble a great deal of wealth in few hands. When it comes to electoral politics in the United States, what do you make of the argument that, I mean, for, first of all, there was a pretty ferocious debate on the left in the United States about the 20. 20- 16 elections. And I think a very significant chunk, even of leftists, ultimately held their noses and voted for Hillary Clinton as a way of sort of voting against yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. Where, where do you come down on these questions when it comes to electoral politics? Well, I think uh, where I come down is to say, well, we've got to organize something which is very different, an alternative on the left. Instead of having what I call, in a sense, the party of Wall Street governing in both parties, the sorts of things that worry me about Trump is what he's doing with the environment, what he might do on nuclear war. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He's totally irrational about some of those kinds of things. So yes, I would rather have Hillary, in, but I don't want to be in a situation in which I say the only answer to somebody like Trump is Hillary, because that, it seems to me, is going back into exactly all those problems that we hit with the first Clinton administration, which was the beginning of this process of the selling out of U.S. government to the bondholders and Wall Street. So we've got to find something which is a non-Wall Street party. And we've got to have a real solid good left movement, which uh, you began to see elements of that crystallizing around Bernie Sanders and, and, and the like, but we need to go further than that, I think. Bernie Sanders identifies himself as a democratic socialist, yeah. and yet his voting record indicates that he supported regime change in Iraq. He said he would continue the drone assassination program as yeah. it existed under right. Obama. Right. Drone is a weapon. When it works badly, it is terrible and it is counterproductive. When you blow up a facility or a building which kills women and children, sure. you know what? It not only doesn't do it, it's terrible. But it's, you're comfortable with the idea of using drones if well, you think you've isolated yes. a, an important terrorist? Yes. What form of socialist would you describe Bernie Sanders as? I mean, is he a Marxist in your view? No, he's a, no, no, he's not a Marxist at all. He's, a, as you say, kind of a social democrats, but social democrats have a rather long history of being rather warlike about all kinds of things and believing in things like military humanism and those sorts of issues. The history of social democracy is rather tainted by all of that. And so I think that there has to be a genuinely left socialist movement. And I think that Sanders, the more he got in, into sort of talking to the millennials, I think his rhetoric began to shift <laughs> away from social democracy to a more socialist line. So that talking about a single payer system and talking about free access to higher education. What's your assessment of the current state of the Democratic Party? I mean, somebody like Chuck Schumer, for example, He's raised more money off Wall Street than almost anybody else in Congress. So, I mean, while I, you know, rhetorically he can say some certain things, I think that he's very much uh, part of that, and Nancy Pelosi also. Well, I thank you for your question, uh, but I have to say we're capitalist, and that's just the way it is. I think that the leadership and the power structure within the Democratic Party is antagonistic somewhat to a kind of real socialist push. And my nervousness is that they will simply have to say, oh, well, they're the alternative to the crazy man Trump, and they will get into power. But that's not going to make any real difference. Uh, it's going to actually uh, exacerbate the problems, as I see it. I don't see them taking on the kind of question of, say, student debt, and, and I don't see them taking on single payer and things of that kind of questions at all. The term neoliberal is thrown around so much these days by people that I think have literally no clue 
what neoliberal economic policy is or neoliberalism is. Give people a definition. What what does neoliberalism mean? I took it to be a political project which originated in the 1970s with the Business Roundtable and the Rockefellers and everybody else, which is to reorganize the economy in such a way as to restore power to an ailing capitalist class. The capitalist class was in difficulties in the late 1960s, early 1970s, because the worker movement was rather strong. There were a lot of community activists, the environmental, were all these reform things coming through, the formation of the EPA and all those kinds of things. So they decided through the business roundtable that they were going to really try to recuperate and accumulate uh, as much economic power as they could amongst themselves. And that uh, had a number of elements uh, to it. For example, if you were faced with a situation of bailing out the people or bailing out the banks, you would bail out the banks and let the people struggle. You would always say if there's a conflict between capital and the well-being of the people, you'll choose capital. That was the simple form of the project. Now, some people say it's just an idea about the free market. Well, yeah, a free market to some of personal responsibility. Yeah, a redefinition of citizenship such that a good citizen is not a needy citizen. So any citizen who's needy is a bad person. <laughs> Social services get set up to punish people as opposed to really assist them and help them. Well, and what, what I often think of as, as one of the most visible aspects of neoliberal economic policy is the notion of austerity measures that yes. are imposed yes. on economies in the global south, but also in the case of Greece, for instance. Yeah. Um, you see this demand from the creditors that the first thing that has to go if we're to give you this debt is your social programs. And the money that you would normally spend on those is going to go toward paying off either the principal or the interest on the money right. that is being generously lent to right. is that, that Well, it's the debt peonage again. You know, you organize debt peonage in such a way as to lock people in, and then they have to pay. But uh, you don't uh, take the money away from the bondholders. I mean, in the case of Greece, for example, it wasn't as if anybody went after the French and the German banks who'd lent all that money to Greece. They kind of basically socialized their debt turn it into the IMF and the European Stability Fund and, and, and all the rest of it, and then made the Greeks pay. Well, actually, if uh, the banks made a bad uh, judgment, they should pay. Uh, but they didn't. And this is this neoliberal principle at work. And I, I tend not to like the term austerity because austerity is used for that policies which are administered to the population. Austerity right. <laughs> is not for capital. <laughs> right. right. Absolutely not for the financial institutions, and it's not for the top 1%. So, so austerity is about social programs. And in fact, the state has been heavily, heavily involved in subsidizing capital so that the banks never get hurt. This is what the neoliberal order is about. When you have politicians campaigning in part on this idea that they're going to reduce the debt or eliminate the debt of the U.S. federal government, what are they really talking about? Well, this is a, a sort of a, a baseball bat which is taken to politics uh, periodically. Uh, remember uh, Dick Cheney saying that Ronald Reagan taught us that debt doesn't matter because Reagan went into debt like crazy, mainly on the military side. Bush also was, was going into debt. Then the Republicans turn around when Obama comes in and says, we've got to do something about the debt, and that becomes the excuse to stop uh, any kind of programs going through. And we see now the Republicans are back into power. What do they do? They increase the debt by, I don't know, one and a half trillion dollars or something like that. They don't, I don't think there's a real issue here. That what is it simply is a political excuse to raise a rhetoric about indebtedness, and we've got to deal with the debt on our children. But then, of course, it's turned around and... Uh, and like this last uh, tax bill, uh, nobody cares about it when, when, in fact, they've been bleating on about the debt for ages and ages before that. But it's a political tool which you use in this particular way in a particular historical moment. Who owns the U.S. debt? China owns a great deal of it. Um, and uh, actually, Russia owns quite a bit. Japan owns quite a bit. And in fact, there's a very interesting story about that, if you want to know. In the middle of the crisis, when uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and AIG were all kind of going in, the Russians uh, went to the Chinese and said to the Chinese, let's sell all our debt in those institutions. 
and that will crash the U.S. economy. <laughs> and it would have done because actually the, the holders of the debt of those institutions were primarily China and Russia. China refused for a very simple reason. It didn't want the U.S. economy to crash because it's a main consumer market. But if Russia and China had decided at that moment to sell all of their, their holdings in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and AIG, the U.S. economy would have gone down. What would it look like if we were to radically reorganize U.S. society under a philosophy or an ideology rooted in Marxism or the social good was actually a, a priority in this country rather than sort of everyone fend for themselves? What would that mean in a country as big and as populated as, as the United States? If I put it sort of uh, crudely, I, th I think the future of the U.S., insofar as it has a radical future, lies more with some sort of what I would call almost non-ideological anarchism. I don't think that uh, it's ready for the kind of collective endeavor that would really be required to confront uh, the power of uh, the Federal Reserve and find an alternative. Uh, I don't think it's ready for thinking about a mass movement of some kind that will actually uh, start to redefine how the economy works. I think if there's going to be any real kind of uh, left, it's going to be a kind of socialist, anarchist kind of left politics that will emerge, which has uh, you know some many redeeming features. I'm coming out of the Marxist history. We're supposed to be very hostile to anarchism, but I, I we have a great deal of appreciation for uh, the anarchist tradition. I think there's an uh, ideological area of overlap there that has something which would be distinctive uh, to U.S. history and culture. And I think we have to recognize the significance and importance of that history. There's no plausible path to that short of a complete collapse of the capitalist state in the United States. Am I wrong? Well, no. I, th I think that uh, one of the things that is going on, on to some degree on the left is the attempt to redefine forms of governmental power, if you want to call it that, which are alternative to the existing state structures. And uh, to some degree, I see the, the activism that's going on at the municipal level as an interesting kind of way to start to explore uh, what those alternative structures might look like. Uh, can we uh, create democratic forms of municipal governance, for example? If so, what kind of institutional structures would work so that people become involved, become unalienated, as opposed to alienated entirely from the, the rather corrupt structures of uh, government that we now have? So I, I think there would need to be already in place the capacity of people to organize themselves into alternative structures of collective governance, which are outside of the conventional forms of the state apparatus. The, the technology that exists right now in the world is such that the world could easily be destroyed many yes. times over um, by single actors in some cases. The United States, uh, Russia, China could instantaneously destroy right. the, the world. Right. Um, the guns and the caliber of weapons that people have in this country are much more fierce than ever before in history. And I'm not even sure that Marx or, or anyone uh, from that era would have been able to imagine the level of destruction that could be caused by one individual person with these weapons. Does that factor into how you think about the future and the possibilities of rebellion or transformation in society? Just the sheer level of destruction that could be wrought by very small groups of people. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I, I don't Do you understand think, what I'm saying? Yes, no, I understand. People are obsessed much, with dystopic no, novels much, and no, everything, no. but it's like, no, uh, I, this guy who killed all these people in Las Vegas, I mean, yeah. the, the amount of firepower right. that that individual had, not just in his hotel room, but also in other properties, I mean, it's 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 un it's like 200 years ago, it'd be unthinkable that, that that one person could hold that kind of power I, in their hand. I, I agree, and I think that politics really has to take account of that. I mean, there's no such thing. I mean, what happened in the American Revolution couldn't happen today. Right. What happened in the French Revolution couldn't happen today. The thing that struck me about Ferguson was the sight of those militarized police. I mean, there's no way, it seems to me, that a political movement can imagine taking to the streets and storming the barricades and getting anywhere. They would simply be mowed down. 
And so therefore, politics has to start to think about uh, a kind of progressive transformation, which does not involve confrontation and violence of that sort, because quite simple, uh, I think uh, any movement of that sort would lose. And therefore, we have to think of something that uh, is an alternative kind of movement. The difficulty is that that uh, movements which are, uh, say, attempting to construct some kind of alternative will get criminalized. And so we see the criminalization of environmentalists. We see the criminalization, as, as we saw in the Dakota pipeline kind of thing, you, you, you criminalize uh, people who are, are engaged in protest. And then, of course, you have the right to go in and kill them. So this is, if you like, the problem on the left. So the left has to think of an alternative strategy and not have dreams of uh, the Russian Revolution or the American Revolution or anything of that kind because right now it's not so much that there's one person got a finger on a button. I mean, if Trump pushes the button, then yeah, well, we're not going to be able to talk about anything. It's a very big button. Yes, right. Much yes, bigger yes, than your button. Yeah, right. Let me so, tell you. Yeah. So, so, I, I, so that's not what worries me so much. But what worries me about is the militarization of social control. And, and the intense militarization and the super militarization of it. So that even something like Occupy, which was a fairly innocent kind of affair in some ways, got treated as a criminal organization, which had to be smashed. Even something as, uh, as elemental as that, it seems to me, is not going to really be able to do very much. The closer we get to actually doing something about the real centers of uh, political and economic power in society, I think that we will be treated as criminals. Something that I've I've said when I've had debates with people who who say you know oh there's going to be a coup in the United States uh, that the military ultimately is going to take over or uh, that they're going to build these FEMA camps uh, etc. And I, I've often argued with people, including from my own world on the left, and said you know what the state doesn't need to do any of that. They, they they don't need to build a camp to put you. They're already winning. That's capitalism in this country. The idea that people think that it requires a finite group of fat white men smoking cigars coming up with a way to lock up all of the dissenters because of their thoughts, that's that's not how that kind of a force operates. It's much more ingrained in every aspect of our life. Yes, and that's why I come back to notions of debt peonage. One of the ways in which social control is exercised is to pe get people so deeply in debt that uh, they cannot imagine anything in their future other than simply living in such a way as to pay off their debt. Uh, and and uh, if you kind of say, what is one of the biggest checks on the radicalism of, say, the millennial generation, it's the huge student debt that hangs around them. And I think that, uh, you know, cognizant of that, uh, they're not going to rock the boat. Debt peonage is, is uh, the order of the day. For young people listening to this right now, what advice would you give them about how to be better contributors to society and making a world more just? Like what... What should young people read and what ideas should they explore as they kind of go further and further out into the world to make it better? Two things. First, uh, while, while you're being on Snapchat and all the rest of it, uh, try and cultivate uh, a circle of uh, very close friends that you can have real communication with because uh, there has to be some ground truthing, as they sometimes say in these words, of, as what all these abstractions which you're getting through the internet are about. And I think that by having a group sitting around a table with none of the devices on and talking and, uh, and drinking and whatever, you know, I mean, just so that you have a real human closeness and to can talk about uh, a lot of the issues that you're encountering. And I would be very much in favor, and I think this has been going on a lot, of forming reading groups. You know, eight, ten people sort of get together, and then once a week they get together and they talk about, uh, I'm not saying everybody should do capital, but have reading groups of that kind so that you can discuss ideas and alternatives. But I also recognize that when I talk to people who've formed those reading groups, and, and that, that they're doing something significantly different from what goes on in terms of... I'm not against uh, all of the, the, the new stuff. I mean, I tend to have a slightly Luddite view of some of this, but, but, but I, 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 I'm all in favor of a lot of it. But there has to be something else going on as well. And, and that something else is something which has to be actively constructed, not, not in opposition to, but in, as a companion to uh, what is going on around them in the Internet. 
What a great note to end on. Uh, Professor David Harvey, thank you very much for joining us on Intercepted. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It's been great. Thank you. David Harvey is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the City University of New York and author of many books. His latest is Marx, Capital, and the Madness of Economic Reason. 